Welcome to Beyond Number 8, where we explore agri-tech innovation in the 21st century. Kiwis are proud of their number eight wire mentality, their ability to innovate with the most basic materials. But in the 21st century, science and technology have provided tools we could have never imagined, opening up new horizons for primary sector innovation. So where is it headed? What opportunities are beckoning? And how can we make sure New Zealand Agritech is ready and able to take advantage of them? Well, here we explore how we can innovate beyond number eight. Hello, and welcome to Beyond Number Eight. I'm Peter Barraclough, the Chief Executive of Lincoln Agritech. And in this series, my colleagues and I will look at the challenges and opportunities facing New Zealand's agritech sector. So today we're talking about the nitrate conundrum. Our agricultural sector has been built on the back of nitrate fertiliser, but now we can see the downstream effects of that nitrate leaching is having on our rivers and our water quality. We can't simply turn off the tap on nitrates, but equally, equally we can't ignore what is happening. So today I'm joined by Blair Miller, Lincoln Agritech's Group Manager for Environmental Research, and by Tim Davey, Director of Science for ECAN, to discuss the nitrate conundrum. So Blair, welcome. Hello Peter. Tim, thanks for coming along. Thank you, Laura, Peter. So, uh, Tim, let's start with you. How have we got here? You know, what's led to the issues that we're facing today? It, I, it depends how far back you go. It's interesting you said about nitrate fertiliser, because it's not just fertiliser, of course. It's all about protein molecules who've got a nitrate atom in them, a, ni a nitrogen atom in them. And it's all about trying to get the nitrogen into protein, and that... You, we use that, we do that through you know, growth and through plants and then animals taking in, in that. And then, but that could come from clovers, for example, or, or legumes that produce nitrogen and, um, and then that's taken up by the animal and it's used as protein. But I mean, that's what it's all about. It's about the nitrogen atom in protein. And what we're trying to do is get that into the protein and not lose much into the environment as we go. So... Agriculture, yep, it comes from agriculture, but it's not just agriculture. It also comes from anything that's got protein and is breaking down, so which includes our human waste. So, you know, nitrate as a problem is predominantly sourced out of agriculture, but it's not just agriculture. What is the effects of nitrogen having on the environment? Who is it affecting and what sort of effects is it having? We can, we can kind of look at it two ways. There's, um, there's an environmental effect. So if there's a lot of nitrogen lost out of agriculture or other systems, it gets into streams and then you get excessive gro plant growth, excessive algae and, and things like that. So it's just... There's too much around. Uh, other plants like algae or plants in the river, they, they love it because there's lots of nitrogen around. They grow, they choke the river, they die, and then they get less loss of oxygen and it's a real problem for the stream system. So that's the environmental effect by and large. But there's also a human health impact and, and that's an impact for, you know, and uh, something that it makes a big difference for our drinking water. Uh, the, the human health is contentious. There's quite a lot of work being done. So at the moment, the human health standards are based around what's often referred to as blue baby syndrome, um, which is it, it's to do with the, uh, the way babies can't process nitrogen as it comes through in a water. Um, and the limit is set at 11.3 milligrams per litre nitrate nitrogen. But it's contentious because there's also work that suggests that some of the cancers, uh, particularly colon cancer, um, could be linked into nitrate in drinking water. But that's contentious. World Health Organization haven't haven't backed that up. They they say it's still unknown. It's still in debate as to whether that is an effect. If that were the case, then the drinking water standard would be much much lower, potentially as low as. 0.8 milligrams per litre or 1 milligrams per litre, and that, that's really different. The environmental effect, we, we can start seeing effects from about points, it depends very much on the stream, but 0.7 milligrams per litre can be an impact. It depends a lot on the environment itself, how often floods come through, how much shade there is, all of these things impact it. So between the two, an environmental effect and a human health effect, we've got a problem. Yeah. 
And so that I'm familiar with that Danish work, which has got a much lower um, threshold for you know potential damage. Can we afford to wait for the World Health Organization to make up their mind on this, or do we need to start acting on it now? Good question. I think that I mean the the reviews that have been done around all of the literature since that study, and they still say it's correlative, meaning there's a correlation between them, yeah. but it doesn't necessarily have a link of a of a proven link. And you know, if you start setting human health standards, drinking water standards that are considerably lower, that puts enormous costs onto society, and it's not just onto the agricultural sector. It's also onto drinking water providers. And, and so they need to be sure that they got it right. And at the so, moment, you can't be sure. Yeah, so it's, it's something you're going to have to pay attention to, you know, very, very carefully continue to watch the science on it. And, and I think the real thing is also that, you know, whatever the limit is, we need to be thinking about it from the environmental side as well. And that does have much lower thresholds. So we need to be driving down our nitrate concentrations regardless. Yeah, perfect. Right, right. Blair, coming to you. So what have people been doing about, you know, um, minimising the impacts on the environment of their nitrate use, you know, in today's world? We're getting progressively getting more and more knowledge. So there's progressively increased awareness of the problem for a start. So certainly the agricultural sector is aware of their linkage and they're aware that, you know, business as usual can't be done. So we've seen from, you know, even over the last 15 years, starting from moving to cows into barns in some situations, where you've got high-risk land, you've got standoff pads for poor conditions, right through to, um, you know, basically changing their winter grazing practices, moving cows off particular areas to other areas, um, far more use of um, fertiliser management softwares and tools to try and understand what best to align demand with, with actual need. Um, far more, a huge amount of work going into effluent management, um, spreading effluent far and wide instead of just having one little spray irrigator going out the back paddock, which, you know, was, you know, some decades ago just the norm. Now getting that effluent out is across as much of the farm as possible. So, yeah, there's been a lot of a lot of uptake of, of, of best management practices, I guess, by farmers. But what we're getting is a lot of continuing research that's continually um, shifting people's focus as new opportunities come in. So, so I'm aware of the time lag issue, you know, takes time for these new practices to flow through the system. Are we seeing the benefits of these yet in terms of the readings of nitrogen that we're seeing in the groundwater? Yes and no, I think is probably the probably the answer there. Um, because of the time lags and the ability to link uh, cause to effect, um, it's very, very difficult. So in small catchments with very shallow, rapid um, transport pathways, there's certainly the potential to see short-term games, but in larger catchments or with more complicated flow paths where we have a mixture of water that's travelling fast to the surface water versus slow through deeper groundwater, that signal is, is far more muted and harder to see. So um, what we do know is if we reduce the amount of nitrogen leaving the root zone, we will eventually get improvement. Um, it's just the time it's going to take. It's a complicated system under there, isn't it? You know, Tim, you know, how do you measure all that? And, and um, we've just had a hard look at our data just very recently, mm. actually trying to see in our groundwater, are we seeing improving trends? And the, the, the actual answer is no, we're not. Mm. Um, but that's a mixture of, the, the, there are kind of two lags that we talk about. There's the lag of the time that it takes to get through the soil, down through and into the groundwater and then the slow movement. But there's also a lag in terms of you put in place plans and things. So for example, in this area um, in and around Selwyn Waihora, where we are, there's a plan in place. It's been in place for five years, but the actual deadline for the changes is next year. Mm. So it takes a while for these things to come through. It's not like a blanket, everything's done. But, you know, there's been, I just agree with what Blair said, we've seen huge changes in behaviour of farmers, behaviour of, uh, you know, changing in agricultural systems, improved irrigation procedures, improved effluent management. You know, these all do make a difference in terms of nitrogen nitrogen loss because what we're trying to do is make it so there's more nitrogen taken up by the plant and the animal and less flushed out through the environment. 
and we're also getting a far better understanding of how the whole system works as well. I mean, the natural ecosystem services are available in some areas where we get natural denitrification. So if we've got that service available to us, that land use capacity uh, for tolerating higher nitrogen losses is far greater than a, an area that doesn't have the, the conditions that we need to see natural denitrification. So as we, you know, there's a lot of research going on at the moment looking at trying to being identify where those areas are and then going forward we may be able to modify our farming systems to take advantage of that so we don't lose production in areas that can support it mm. but we may have to see land use change in other areas if we're going to get long-term sustained improvement. Yeah so there's there's a lot of going on already there's a lot of awareness. Uh, Blair what's some of the cutting edge technologies and research that's coming through that you know that might make a difference? Well, I think every 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 sector of the agriculture and horticultural system in New Zealand is is working on different um, mitigations for it. I mean, we've got you know different feed types. The project we're working on with Dairy and Z around the use of plantain, the herb, to, to reduce nitrogen losses. Yeah. Um, basically, getting cows to urinate more widely. It's got nitrogen inhibitors in there. There's a whole lot of potential uh, benefits, which will just become one of the tools in the toolboxes that farmers can use plantain in their pasture mixes, and that may be a mitigation through to. Uh, a lot of work be done around genetics and genetic improvement to see if um, we can make animals that are, are less likely to to create uh, leaching problems. Um, just generally changing feed types, removing grass, putting grain, all sorts of other um, ways that you know that farm systems can be tuned to to improve. Um, you know, continuing research on irrigation efficiency, um, better application of fertilizer, targeting fertilizer application. There's 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 work going on all over the place from the, the arable guys to the dairy guys. Everybody's working hard to see if they can um, pinpoint tools to add to the toolbox. And, and look, if I had to highlight one of the things I think has been a significant change in the last 10 to 15 years is the amount of research that's, that's kind of shifted out of the production sector and into okay, how do we lessen our environmental impact while maintaining good production levels. So. So, you know, there has been a change and we're seeing significantly more research into these sorts of the things that Blair's talked about. Catch crops is another one yeah. that, you know, ar around practical solutions to lessen that nitrogen loss. You know, just even standing cows off on concrete yeah. um, for two hours after milking and, and collecting that effluent. Um, there's just little tuning of the farming system that, that may have significant um, improvements to the outcomes. So there's a lot of technologies there that, that are there and that are coming on stream. How do we measure? How do we know it's making a difference? I know at Lincoln Agritech we've uh, developed a groundwater nitrate sensor. Blair, how do you see that sensor, you know, fitting into this equation? Well, if, if we can't measure it, we can't manage it. It's as simple as that. I mean, that's our catch line at work, obviously. Um, measure, model, manage. Um, we need data. We need to be able to collect consistent, long-term, real-time data. The issues with groundwater and surface water is they, they are dynamic and just taking grab samples periodically it doesn't necessarily tell you the whole picture. Um, last winter was a classic when we had the you know, 1 in 200 year rain event and we had significant losses of nutrients that were stored in the, in the, in the zone above the aquifer um, and that was a very short window until that dissipated but we wouldn't have seen that without continuous monitoring. So the more data we can collect and the most and the spatially replicated data that we can collect, having one point in a catchment isn't ever going to tell us what we need to know. We need to get data collection throughout a catchment. So why individual farmers um, will, will take on technology like this, it's when we get all the farmers together and the regional councils and that to collect that spatially uh, distributed data set, then we'll really start to understand where sources are and, and, and sinks are and, and what the dynamics and changes are. So, Tim, there's no silver bullet here, is it? There's a whole range of things we've got to measure. We've got to have a lot of measurements. We've got to have them more frequently. There's a whole range of technologies. You know, how, how are we going to solve this? Are we going to solve this in the next 20 years? Um, I, I, I'm expecting to see improvements over the next 20 years and, and it'll be gradually things getting better and better. I, it's not going to be solved in the sense of it'll go away and we sort out something else. It'll, it will still be an issue. I think... You know, we've got to think about this in the long term as well. This is not just a result of land use over the last 10 years, 15 years or 20 years. It's actually about the result of land use on the, in our case, in the Canterbury Plains, but throughout New Zealand over the last 150 years. Mm -hmm. You know, nitrogen has been into the environment through legumes, clover and, uh, you know, getting into 
and increase levels for a long time. So, you know, we it's not just a, you, you can't just point at a single sector and go, it's that, that sector's problem. It's across all of the things. And we've got to, you know, and, and that includes urban as well. It's a, we, it, nitrogen has contributed through the, the breakdown of human waste mm. and another source of nitrogen that we need to be thinking about how we treat our waste. Do we just pump it out to sea with high nitrate levels, which is what a lot of places do at the moment? Do we need to do other things as well? There is no silver bullet. We all need protein. Mm. That's where it, you know. That's why I brought it back to protein. We all need protein. That requires a nitrogen atom, and therefore we're going to have this issue for a long time. So, Tim, you've been working a lot of your career, and ECAN's working very hard at trying to understand and solve this problem. How's the coordination between what you're doing at a regional level with the central government's um, directives on this area? Yeah, look, I think it's been a, um, a recognition over a number of years that this is an issue we really need to get on top of. Canterbury, it's, it's been a significant problem and we've been working through our land and water regional plan and it's been over the last sort of 10 to 15 years. There's now a centralised system across government around national standards and things and that, that certainly helps. It, um, so, you know, there is a concerted effort across government around it. You know, the, there's always difficulties around when you put in place plans and then things change, and that's a difficult. That's difficult for a, an investor, whether they're a farmer or whoever, and it's also difficult in terms of the regulator, and that you're having to redo plans and, and things like that. And but we're working our way through that at the moment. So Tim, we've talked about you know nitrates and farming, but you know um, if we want food production, there is an impact on the environment. You know, so uh, what other things can we be doing to um, to minimise our impact, and and what's a connection with that and nitrates and farming. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a fundamental mistake, I think, to just concentrate on a single thing like nitrate. The, if you are thinking about it as lessening your environmental um, footprint or impact, then you will be lessening your nitrate loss. But you will also be looking at other things around the farm and you'll be lessening your ph- phosphorus loss or E. coli into the water system, into streams, and uh, you'll also be thinking about habitat of streams on your farm and uh, and things like that. So that to th- just think about it as nitrate alone is a problem. Yeah. So it's all about lowering the environmental impact. That's what that's what we're trying to do. And you know, if you think about it from the other side of it, and you think if you're a fish living in a stream and just nitrogen goes down, but at the same time lots of sediment comes in, the, the habitat's terrible because everything's removed around it, you'll die. So you can't think of it as just nitrate alone. You've got to think about it on all of these things. And that's why Blair talked about good management practice. You know, That's what good management practice is aimed at doing, lessening the environmental impact, thinking about what you're doing, how it impacts the groundwater, how it impacts any streams nearby, and, and trying to lessen the losses in nitrogen, phosphorus, E. coli, sediment, all of these things make a difference. You, know, you guys are experts in the field. It's hard for the lay people to uh, understand it all. Hopefully today's um, podcast gives people an opportunity to think about it. Um, we know that there's some really clever people working on it. So um, thanks, Tim, for coming in and, and jo- sharing your thoughts. And thanks, Blair, for coming in. Um, you know, we're in, we're in safe hands with you guys working at the front edge of this problem. So thank you very much. Thanks for listening to Beyond Number 8, presented by Lincoln Agritech. To find out more about Lincoln Agritech, visit lincolnagritech.co.nz. Subscribe to our newsletter in the podcast description below or find us on LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube or Facebook and keep up to date with our latest science and innovation. Until the next episode, when we'll continue exploring beyond number eight.